every day you wake up, you open your eyes and see this movie that plays from the inside of your own head. Don't worry about me, I will get up from the bed eventually. Anyway, this movie is called Your Life. This movie seems to change depending on what you're doing, where you are, how you are, and even what you're thinking about. Everything that you have ever known, including everyone that you know, all of this was made possible because you've seen it from this movie that plays inside your head. And from this movie, one day, a thought comes up. What would the movies of other people look like? And then you start thinking some more. What if I was like Truman from The Truman Show? What if I was living in this big simulated environment where everyone and everything around me are actors, including my mother, father, significant other, and even my best friend? What if I notice no glitches in this simulated environment and I never realize that I am in a simulated environment? What if everyone and everything that I interact with are just zombies? They act exactly the way I expect them to act, but they have no movies that play inside their heads. They have no sense of consciousness. And then you wonder, how would I be able to tell that I am not the only conscious being in the universe? To attempt to answer this really big question, let's start with something very basic, the ability to make decisions. Almost all living organisms do seem to take decisions on a daily basis. Now those decisions might just be reactions to changes in their external environment. It could be random, especially on an individual level. They could be optimal or suboptimal, but that's not the point of this discussion. The point is choices are being made by living organisms. Take viruses, for example, which may or may not be living organisms. It depends on who you ask, really. It doesn't matter. Even viruses, which are quite simple, can make decisions at least at one particular point in their existence. When you check something a bit larger than viruses, like bacteria, they have quite a few more options in terms of the decisions that they can take. When you go up to something even larger, multicellular organisms, then things start to get a bit more complicated because now you have two things that can make decisions, the cells themselves and the organism that is made up of those cells. It's even more complicated than that because it depends on what cells you're talking about, what function they serve in relation to the organism that is made up of those cells. Let me give you an example. White blood cells in the human body enjoy quite a bit more freedom in the way they can move than, for example, a bone cell. A bone cell has to be, you know, bone. Although there has been some recent evidence recently that white blood cells do seem to be affected pretty highly by decisions from Big Boss, the brain. Regardless, you can see that there are choices being made at the cellular level and the organism overall. Besides living organisms, you also have non-living things that take decisions at every single point of your day. When you type something into Google and Google attempts to auto-complete it for you based on your location, search term history, and how other people have searched, it is making a decision. When your car's computer automatically adjusts the car's suspension, it is making a decision. When IBM's Watson chooses an answer on the TV show Jeopardy based on a probability assessment from 200 pages of structured and unstructured content, it is making a decision. However, just because all of those things seem as if they are taking decisions does not necessarily mean that they are conscious of such decisions or of anything else for that matter. In fact, if everyone and everything around you took decisions exactly as they did right now without having any sense of consciousness, from your own perspective, from your own movie that you see, everything is absolutely fine. Just take a look at your own body. Your brain takes decisions on your behalf all the time without you knowing anything at all. Adjusting your heart rate at particular times, automatically correcting information that comes through your senses. Here is a question. Why do you need consciousness then? If you can function exactly as a human would function, 
Why is there consciousness? Why do you see this movie? Before we delve into that, let's explore a few weird things about consciousness that don't seem to make sense at all. One of which is that consciousness doesn't seem to stay the same over time. Do you know what this movie that is playing in your head looked like when you were six months old? Probably not. Did you have a movie at that time that was playing inside your head? Difficult to tell. What about now? What does it look like now? You know what it looks like. I don't know what it looks like. What will it look like when you are 80 or 90 years old? Difficult to tell. Consciousness doesn't even seem to need to abide by the physical laws of our universe. You can start daydreaming about becoming Superman and reversing time on Earth, and it would make sense inside your head. I, I mean, you know that it's not real, but what about dreams? Dreams, you can become conscious of them, and you wouldn't even know that you are in a dream. And they can be about absolutely nonsense stuff. You can even mess with systems that give rise to consciousness, and consciousness, at least from the outside, seems to stay relatively the same. There are patients who have gone through hemispherectomy where half of their brain was removed, but after a period of recovery, they do seem to function quite well. There is something called the heart problem of consciousness. In very basic terms, it is the following. Why is this collection of neurons a physical system allowing you to experience what you experience? Why do you see this movie that plays inside your head in a particular way and not in any other way? Now, there are quite a few ways for you to attempt to address this problem, but we're not going to go into those. The one I would like to focus on is called the Integrated Information Theory, and it is unique in the sense that it attempts to provide a mathematical structure to explain the nature of consciousness. The theory is based on several axioms. You could call them generally accepted statements about the nature of consciousness. The first of those axioms is called intrinsic existence, as in external things should be separated from your consciousness. For example, I experience things the way I experience things. <coughs> My consciousness is my consciousness. And you experience things the way you experience things. Your consciousness is your consciousness. We're separated. <coughs> the second one is called composition, as in consciousness is structured. For example, this is a keychain. It's also red. It's also a Lego thing. And from my perspective, it's to the right. This is a pen also green, and where it is, from my perspective, is to the left, and so on and so forth. You get the picture, consciousness is structured. The third one is called information, as in each experience is the particular way it is. What you are experiencing right now is part of a huge set of possible experiences that you could be having, but the one you are having right now is the one you are having right now. The fourth one is called Integration, as in you experience a whole experience, not just one particular bit. When you watch a movie, you don't just see the left side or the right side only, or the right side without seeing the left side. You don't just see the actor's nose only, or you just see the background. You see everything. You experience everything. And consciousness is the same. The fifth one is called exclusion. You don't have two, three, four, or even more experiences at the same time. One where you see things slightly slower than they should be. One, you see things redder than they should be. One, the sound is a bit different. No, you have <coughs> one experience that you experience. Yeah, no different. more than that. You're not like a subatomic particle where you exist in a superposition of possible states until you're observed. And for these axioms, there are a number of mechanisms when addressed together can give you a measurement for the quantity and quality of consciousness for a particular system, depends on what it is. Now, there are quite a bit of mathematics for these mechanisms, which we will not touch in this video at all. I would actually recommend if you are interested in the subject and you would like something much more comprehensive than the simplified version that I'm presenting in this video, that you watch 
a couple of lectures by the people who are very much hands-on with the theory, Dr. Christoph Koch and Professor Giulio Tenoni, and read the paper that explains the integrated information theory. All the links are in the description. The theory explains consciousness as a fundamental property of the universe. Fundamental properties are important when it comes to how the universe functions. For example, an elementary particle spin or charge or the dimensions of space. In the theory, consciousness emerges due to the way matter is organized within a particular system. If the theory becomes the standard for measuring consciousness, then there are interesting things that arise because of it. The most important of which is that consciousness can be measured. You can actually assign a number to it. It's very difficult to measure a very complex system like the human brain, but it should be possible. This means that you, as a human, you have a different level of consciousness than, say, your dog, probably going to be higher. And your dog has a different level of consciousness than, say, I don't know, a spider. And that has a different level of consciousness than even non-living organisms, such as, I don't know, your TV or your washing machine. You get the idea. As part of this, you yourself, you have changed over time. This means the level of consciousness that you have had has changed as well. This also can explain why you have different levels of consciousness during the day. Sleeping, eating, doing drugs, don't do drugs, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. Consciousness can be measured. The fundamental nature of consciousness may have also created an opportunity for living organisms to evolve and organize certain parts of themselves to become more conscious, eventually leading to things like the brain. Being highly conscious can actually be advantageous to living organisms, especially if they live in an environment that is complex, where the living organism has to process different types of information as a whole experience and make a decision based on that. The theory also shows that just because you observe something acting in a very complex way, that does not mean it is highly conscious. For example, if you made a robot, a robot that looks like a human, and you programmed it using what is called a feed-forward network, and you made this robot act exactly the way a human would act, that does not mean it is conscious. Even if this robot passed the Turing test, a test that a machine passes, if it fools a human into thinking it is a human itself, it does not mean that it is highly conscious. In fact, a feed-forward network will have the same level of consciousness as a rock. It's essentially a zombie that acts in a very complex way, but has no sense of consciousness. The theory also predicts that if you were to get a bunch of physical systems together, this collection of systems does not necessarily become conscious. For example, if we all get together in a room and we start discussing consciousness, apparently all of you look like me, the discussion itself does not necessarily become conscious. In fact, if the information we exchange with each other becomes too integrated, we attach ourselves with some kind of a really evolved internet cable thing, then the theory predicts that this collection of us, where, where the information between us became too integrated, is now the conscious thing, and the components should, in theory, lose their consciousness. Now, with all of that said, if you live in a universe where you cannot provide proof whether you are or are not the only conscious being. If you had a solid theory that explained why you have consciousness, the integrated information theory may or may not become that, it depends on how it's developed, then you can provide proof whether you are or are not the only conscious being. In the context of the integrated information theory, you can say, well, since my brain is organized in this particular way, matter within it is organized in this particular way, and your brain also has kind of the same structure, then we should have similar levels of consciousness and similar types of consciousness. Until then, however, all I have to say is good morning, and in case I don't see you, 
Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. That has been my take on Are You the Only Conscious Being? Thank you very much, and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching, folks. I am turning off my consciousness, temporarily, that is, until the next time. Take care. Goodbye.